Our speaker today is Carlo Chris S. Apurillo, and we he says that we should hope should call him uh, Chris. Chris is a special science teacher five at the Philippine Science High School Eastern Visayas Campus in Leyte. He is also a registered uh, medical technologist, and currently he is on detail at as a quality assurance officer of the Eastern Visayas Regional. COVID-19 testing center uh, at the Eastern Visayas Regional Medical Center in Tacloban. Uh, he graduated magna cum laude in BS Medical Technology from the RDR Medical Foundation in Tacloban City and completed his MS Microbiology from the University of Santo Tomas. In 2014, he was trained in uh, molecular systematics at the State Key Laboratory of Mycology Institute of Microbiology of the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, China. His works focus on diversity of fungi and bacteria and their pharmaceutical applications. At present, he is the vice president of the Philippine Network of Microbial Culture Collections and a member of the board of the Biology Teachers Association. So everybody, let us all give a warm welcome to Sir Carlo Chris Apurillo. Sir Carlo, Sir Chris. Hello everyone, good morning. Thank you very Hello, good much morning, sir, for, mm -hmm. for the introduction. Okay, let me just share my screen. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank Marian de Leon for inviting me and the UPLBMNH for having me in this biodiversity series. Indeed, it is an honor to be able to share with you uh, some of the things that we have um, uh, that we have actually discovered regarding this uh, fungal endophytes. So what you see on your screen right now are actually beautiful pictures, beautiful, <laughs> uh, beautiful pictures of cultures of fungal endophytes. So those are all fungi and some of them have pictures of their conidia or their spores. So this is what we are going to talk about today as I share with you exploring mangrove fungal diversity and natural products. So as a personal note, when I started as the, my study on this, I was not actually interested with the fungi. Because as we all notice, my my background is more of uh, I'm more of from the medical sciences rather than pure biology. My interest here was more on the natural products, as I was working then on multi drug resistant bacteria. So I was looking for sources of natural products which can have antibacterial activity against MDRs, but are not plants because. Uh, plants are not that sustainable when it comes to uh, as a source of uh, natural products. So I stumbled upon uh, fungal endophytes, specifically mangrove fungal endophytes. And <clears throat> this is where my journey on mangrove fungal endophytes started, actually. However, when I discussed this with my advisor then, uh, Dr. Thomas Edison de la Cruz of the, of the University of Santo Tomas, he told me that he cannot study the natural products without studying the fungi. I will not let him do that. And so um, this is where uh, we started the, the usual two-pronged approach into this study, where we study the fungi, because most of these fungi are, are not well studied, especially here in the Philippines. And after that, we study the natural products. However, it seemed that uh, um, in, in the years that we've been doing this, our focus had been more on the diversity of the fungi because there is not really much in the literature, especially on uh, those related with mangroves. Why are we excited with mangroves? Because in the Philippines, there are about 46 mangrove species, and this is a very good, these are very good sources of different microorganisms. And so if we have 46 mangrove species, 
then you would only you would expect so many species of of fungal endophytes that can actually be isolated from these mangroves. In many studies done abroad, they have already reported many um, bioactivities of fungal endophytes coming from mangroves. They have been reported to, be to have antibacterial activities, cytotoxic activities, and also antioxidant activities. And indeed, these are just some of the bioactive compounds that have been reported from fungal endophytes. So you should see there a plethora of substances or bioactive compounds that were derived from fungal endophytes. Now, <clears throat> studies on fungal endophytes had also been um, had also increased because of the fact that some of the bioactive substances that are now being used have also been isolated from fungal endophytes. Um, one very common example is, a, is an anti-cancer drug toxin, which had actually been isolated. Uh, this was first isolated from a tree, from taxus. But this was isolated from an endophytic fungus, taxomyces andreanae. And in terms of production, it's easier, of course, to grow the fungi, to mass produce the fungi, and to get these same uh, bioactive compound. That is why studies on fungal endophytes have actually increased throughout the world. <clears throat> so basically, fungal endophytes are just fungi that reside inside the internal tissues of living plants, but the caveat is that there is no, uh, it does not cause any immediate overt negative effects on the plants. That means that these are inside the tissues of the plants, but they do not cause any disease in the plants. So um, if you will see from this illustration here, um, the relationship between um, the plant, the host plant and the fungus is what we usually call as a balanced antagonism which means that um, the plant is able to be, uh, the plant has, uh, has a somewhat, uh, uh, it's able to protect itself from the fungus, which is living inside it. And the fungus is not also causing any, any disease inside the plant. And that qualifies that fungus to be a fungal endophyte. Many of the studies actually being done on fungi in the Philippines focus on pathogenic fungi from plants. So this is different because these are the non-pathogenic fungi that reside in plants. Now, there, there is a theory that, you know, the bioactive compounds that are actually being, that some of the bioactive compounds that are produced by the plants are actually being mediated or being produced by the fungal endophytes. So that this is how close the relationship is between the plant and the fungal endophyte. <clears throat> so in the study of fungal endophytes, we usually, um, we usually follow two phases, as I have said, because, you know, I only wanted the phase two. As many of the studies in, in fungal endophytes actually only focus on phase two. When I was starting my studies in fungal endophytes, I have found many journals that do not even identify the fungi. They just say fungus one, fungus two, fungus three, and these are the bioactive compounds. Fungus four, these are the bioactive compounds. Or sometimes at least there's an effort to identify it, but only to the genus level. But you know, when you identify a fungus to the genus level, there are still so many species within that genus so that it is, actually very important, and I understand it now, that when we study the fungi, we have to resolve the identification up to the species level. And so this is what we uh, usually do. So on, on the phase one of the study, we collect the healthy leaves from mangrove plants, we isolate the mangrove fungal endophytes, we do a polyphasic ID, which is a combination of molecular and morphologic, okay? A morphologic first, then molecular, okay? And then 
we compute the diversity of the of the fungal endophytes. Then for phase two, we we get the fungal species that we have identified in phase one. We do mass production, and then we do the bioassays, including antibacterial, cytotoxic, or sometimes antioxidant. Or the usual things that we do are antibacterial and cytotoxic. So specifically, this is the workflow for studying the, um, the fungal endophytes. So first, we collect healthy leaves from the mangroves. So it's important that we collect the healthy leaves because if we um, collect the deceased leaves, then there is a possibility that we will be able to isolate the pathogenic fungi. Then we prepare leaf discs out of these leaves. Um, when we say leaf, uh, we are able to do this by using a one hole puncture. So if you'll notice, we, have, we now have discs of the leaves, about six millimeters. Um, and then we plate it on PDA, five discs per plate. And then uh, we prepare a six plates so that we have actually a sample of 30 from one host. And then that is where the, then we wait until the fungi will actually grow. We also have a plate that we call uh, that we, uh, where we check the surface sterilization so that we will know if the surface sterilization was um, effective or not. Um, the purpose of surface sterilization is to kill all the microorganisms outside the, the leaves on the surface of the leaves so that we will only isolate what are inside uh, the, the leaves because we are interested with the fungal endophytes. So um, we have a control plate where we touch the, the surface sterilized leaves. So if we see fungal growth in this control plate, then that means that the surface sterilization was not effective. And so we have to go back again to square one, okay? Or we do optimization of the surface sterilization. So this picture here is already an isolate, actually. This is not the one that, that um, is coming from here, since uh, there would usually be growth around the leaf disks. Then once we are able to isolate, we purify the, the isolates. And once we only have one species in, in a particular plate, <clears throat> then we can already do the morphological um, analysis. We usually look at the form of the colony, the color of the colony, uh, the form. Then if there are spores, then we study the spores. But most usually the difficulty in studying fungal endophytes is that many of them do not produce spores. This is the reason why most of the reports then that are not using, um, that, are, that we're not using molecular techniques would usually only report mycelia esterila because no spores are produced. This may be due to the fact that the fungal endophytes are actually living inside the, the the plant, and there may be no reason to sporulate or to produce the spores inside the plant. <clears throat> then we do a, the molecular techniques. Okay, so here we do DNA extraction, and then we do PCR amplification. The first, uh, the first marker that we study is the ITS, which is the internal transcribed spacer. But if we are not able to resolve the identity of the, the species of the fungus using the ITS alone, although many of the fungi can actually be resolved using ITS alone, but there are some genera that, uh, that cannot be resolved using ITS alone. So we add some more genes into the analysis depending on the genus that is being studied. You will see that a little bit later when I uh, show the results. And then after PCR amplification, we send it for sequencing. Then 
after sequencing, we do a blast search and do a full-blown phylogenetic analysis in order to see the identification of the uh, isolated fungal endophytes. But after that, we're able to do a biodiversity assessment if needed. So for phase two, which is the assay for biological activities, from our isolate, we do a mass production in PDB. So this is a broth, potato dextrose broth. We usually uh, let it grow for four weeks at room temperature, but you know it can be extended for more than four weeks. But you know, in the lab, we're always in a hurry to get our results. So the, the list that you can do is four weeks. Then after four weeks, you can harvest it uh, already. But Unfortunately, because we only grow it for four weeks, you usually get only a very small amount of extract, but that is already enough, in a way, enough for the, um, for the tests that you are going to do. The, the extract is usually enough already. Then we extract it with ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate is usually used because it is not miscible with water. So you replace it with a broth and then you mix it with a broth, it will easily separate and you get to extract the, uh, the bioactive compounds there. But you know, since we're only using a one solvent, which is ethyl acetate, that's also a limiting factor in the types of bioactive compounds that we are able to extract. Okay. Then we get our crude extract. We do our antibacterial activity using either Kirby Bauer diffusion or broth microdilution. Um, we just uh, sometimes we use my broth microdilution because some of the bioactive compounds do not easily diffuse through agar, so they um, they tend to have false negatives in a Kirby Bauer diffusion assay. For cytotoxicity. We were able to test um, growing the fungus in stationary and the other one in an agitated um, in an agitated environment, meaning it's shaken all the time. So instead of forming um, mat, a fungal mat on the surface of the broth, this actually forms fungal balls. Okay, when it is constantly uh, shaken. So, um, because uh, we actually thought this was actually an idea that I got when I was in, in, in Beijing, because there was this thought that um, <clears throat> um, there might be a different uh, behavior of the fungi when you shake it or when you just grow it in a, in a stationary condition. We will look at the results of this a little bit later. Okay, so. Again, we extract it with uh, ethyl acetate and then do rotary evaporation and then we get the crude extract. So we usually use the MTT assay for cytotoxic screening. So in the first study that we did, um, we actually uh, collected um, samples from Leite and Samar. So you'll notice that most that my studies are all from Leyte or Samar. Ano lang to, may pagka-selfish ito because, you know, I'm from here. And, you know, there are very, very few reports of microorganisms or fungal endophytes coming from this area. So it had become our mission to actually explore the things that we have here. So <clears throat> um, if you will notice from, from, this, from this study that we, we did, we had mangroves from Leyte and we had from Samar. We had three common species from Leyte and Samar, which are Sonarasha alba, Isophora mucronata, and Aegiseras florinum. And then we were able to get another species from Leyte, which is Avicenia marina, which we were not able to find in our site in Samar. Okay. You will notice that despite the fact that these are the same species of mangrove hosts, we were able to see different species of mangrove fungal endophytes. And you will notice that all of these fungal endophytes that you'll see here have been identified up to their species level. So hindi namin tinantanan until ma-identify to the species level. Okay, 
So you will notice that, for example, for Sonoracia alba, we were able to isolate Valsa brevispora only in Leyte, but we were able to um, isolate with Nardia mangiferae, Marasmie, uh, Marasmielus palmivorous, and Aspergillus nidulans from Samar with the same species of the mangrove. Then for Rhizophora macronata, we also have completely different isolates, even if you have the same species. For Aegisiras, we were not able to isolate anything here in Leyte, while we only have one isolate here in Samar. For Abyssinia, you'll notice that most of the isolates are Polytotricum, Polytotricum fructicula, Polytotricum queenslandicum, Polytotricum tropicale, and a potentially novel species of the Yaporte. Okay, so these are um, for uh, these are actually the, the first time that for many of these, these are the first time that they are being reported as mangrove fungal endophytes. Okay, because as I have said, most of the studies on fungal endophytes do not um, identify them up to the species level. So um, to give you an idea on some of the isolates that we have now, the usual isolate that we usually get from mangroves through, through the years is this one, Wignardia mangiferae or um, Phylosticta capitalensis. So we usually see this, parang, parang wala pa kaming study na nagawa na hindi lumalabas ang Wignardia mangiferae. So, um, it had been also previously reported as an endophyte of coffee arabica in Brazil. Um, we were able to isolate verticillium degrisens, and it is interesting because verticillium is actually known as a plant pathogen. It is known as a plant pathogen that's causing verticillium will, but in this particular instance, this species of fungus is actually a fungal endophyte that is not causing any disease in the mangrove. Then we have Pestalochopsis adusta. If you are going to look at this one, um, this was not um, identified using just IPS, so we have to add two more genes to that. So in order to be able to identify this to the to its but actually when you look at the spores of this this is actually already um specific to pestalochopsis um however we just wanted to make sure and we we have to that we always want to have a molecular um evidence of the of the identification of the isolate and so we use three genes here. You have IPS, TEF, translation elongation factor, and tubulin. And we were able to confirm um, that this is Pestalochopsis adusta. We're actually using two statistics here. We're using maximum likelihood and Bayesian probability. So if you'll notice, they are both one in this plane. So this is a confirmation that this is Pestalochopsis adusta. Uh, in the past, Pestalochopsis adusta have been reported to have antibacterial activity. For Polytotricum, Polytotricum is a very large complex um, fungi. So it's actually difficult to, I, to identify Polytotricum species. So in order to identify Polytotricum to the species level, we have to use one, two, three, four, five, six genes <laughs> in order to identify them to the species level. Uh, ITS, Calmodulin, Tubulin, GAPDH, APMAT, and ACT. Although lately, there had been a publication that says that APMAT is actually enough to, uh, to determine the the species of the Polytotricum, but when we tried it, we still could not actually resolve the Polytotricum species. So we were able to report Polytotricum queenslandicum as a, as a mangrove fungal endophyte, and this species was first isolated from Tarita papaya in Queensland. So we believe that this is actually the first 
ever uh, report of Queensland Decom being a mangrove fungal endophyte. Then um, we have um, Diaporte. For Diaporte, you will notice the original tree here on the left. It actually contains about 300 species of Diaporte. Nandito lahat sa tree na to. That's why you cannot, you can no longer see the, the um, specific species in the tree. So those are the ones that were included in our final genetic analysis. Now, you will notice that despite the fact that we have about 300 species here already, you have an isolate, we had an isolate that actually branches out of all of the clades of all of the species of diaporte. But this is diaporte because, you know, it's within that, that particular clade you will see that it's within this, this group of organisms. So therefore, um, <clears throat> this diaporte that you see is actually a novel species. So this is a, a novel species of diaporte. So another reason why we are also, why we are, we are also interested in resolving the identification of this mangrove fungal endophytes is so that um, is, is also is that we believe that there are still many novel species that have not been discovered. So here we saw we saw one already. Unfortunately, this had not yet been reported and published, okay? Because it's actually difficult to it's actually difficult to um, report a novel fungal species as you need to have good pictures of different parts of the fungi, then we need to deposit it in different um, culture collections. We're working on that. Okay. Now, this is a summary of the diversity indices in this first study that we have. And you'll notice that um, the, the one which is the most diverse is that uh, of Rhizophora mucronata in, in summer, and it has also the highest species richness. But, you know, um, in, in the studies that we have done so far, the, the diversity usually changes in different environments. So it's really interesting to see the, the dynamics of the host and the fungi as they, as you actually change in different environments as you go from one environment to another. And we also see different fungi in different environments and in different mangrove hosts. So when we tested for the antibacterial activity of this MFA extracts, here we used the growth microdilution method. We see that we have potential um, uh, extracts here. We have uh, for P. Uh, Pestalochopsis adusta, because as I have said, this had already been reported to have antibacterial activity. You'll see that it has the lowest MIC of 0 0.08 uh, milligrams per ml for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And that is for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is something exciting. And then for S. aureus, we have 0.63 for Piadusta, Queenslandico, and Tropicale. For the rest, there, um, there's also 0.63 here for Queenslandico, Tropicale, and uh, Marasmelus palmibus. So in a way, we see here that the MFA extracts have potential antibacterial activity. So this is where we usually stop in the in the um, analysis of, of bioactivity. Because after this one, we give this to our collaborators, so our chemists, who usually continue on in the purification of the extracts. And then it's just returned to us for testing of the bioactivities. This uh, shows the MBC or the minimum bactericidal concentration. And we see that uh, it's still it's although it had become higher because you know the MDC is always is supposedly to be is supposedly higher always in the M MIC 
uh, it's 0.63 still for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That means that it is indeed a good candidate for, a, for an antibacterial agent. And we have to note that these are still um, crude extracts, so wala pang purification na ginawa. So for cytotoxicity testing, these are the results. Now, we don't really see any candidate here because most of the IC50 are high. Um, um, the National Cancer Institute of the USA actually says that the, in order to be a good candidate, the IC50 should be lower than 20 micrograms per ml. So here, medyo wala tayo makukuha dyan. Um, and things sometimes happen like that, but you don't have a candidate in any of your isolates, then so be it. However, there is one thing that we were able to, to, to see here, uh, to, to actually discover here, that in fact, there is really a difference in the production of bioactive compounds when the fungi are grown in a stationary condition and in an agitated condition. If you will notice here for Silaria cubensis, if it's grown in stationary condition, the IC50 is 99.4. In agitated condition, it's very high at 306.2. That means it's more effective if it's grown in a stationary condition. However, that is not always the case. It's for example, for Diaporthes cyanensis, it's better if it's grown in an agitated condition. Okay, so. That is, that is something that we got from this experiment. But as, for, as far as candidates for uh, cytotoxic agent, there's uh, none there, okay? Although they do have um, some actions because they do have uh, IC50, at least umabot ng below 100 ang Silaria cubensis, okay? Then uh, we did another study naman on another set of mangroves. Uh, this is not together with my students. So here we only focused on one species, but one was old, the other one was young. The, the one was old, this is very old, I think more than 50 years old, and the other one was just a young mangrove. And we were able to see that we isolated actually common isolates from these two species. Um, you'll see here again all the fungi identified to the species level because again we used a polyphasic approach using morphological and molecular techniques. So um, here um, you will notice that there are unique isolates that were isolated from the old Soderasha alba, which are Trametis lactinea, Valsa brevispora, Aspergillus costaricaensis, and Fusarium sulani. Now, you will notice again that these are unique isolates from the isolates that I have shown you in, in the previous study on mangroves. And this only means that there is a very high diversity of these mangroves in this. Uh, the, <laughs> there is a very high diversity of these fungal endophytes in these mangroves. That's why we do not actually stop studying them. As we usually see, many species appear that we do not actually expect uh, to appear as a mangrove fungal endophyte. Okay? So now, um, in this particular group, we were able to test all these extracts, no? And we have a very good candidate here in terms of cytotoxicity. We found out that Polytotricum gluiosporoides has an IC50 of 7.54 micrograms per ml. So as I have told you earlier, um, the, the of, of the National Cancer Institute of the U.S. is actually 20 micrograms per ml. And we see here a candidate because the IC50 is 7.54 micrograms per ml. So we are now in the process again of purifying this and then doing some purification in HPLC and then test that it should be tested again. But 
Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, things are going slow in the laboratory. And I'm not even in my research lab now. Okay, so <clears throat> in another study, we have again a different set of mangrove from a different mangrove forest in Leyte. Um, the species, the, these are not fungal endophytes, these are not people. So these are, these are people. So these are my students who did this study. This is our mentor, Sir Tom. This is Dr. Thomas Edison de la Cruz of the University of Santo Tomas. Okay, so the hosts, there were four hosts, uh, Sony Rasha Alba, Risotora Mucronata, Avicennia officinalis, and uh, Avicennia corniculatum. Okay, um, so um, you'll notice again that there are again different species, some fungal endophytes that came out, out of these hosts. So again, our favorite is here, Grignardia mangiferae, some Polytotricum, again, Grignardia mangiferae, Grignardia mangiferae here. But you'll notice also that you have new fungi that have not been named, that have not appeared before in any of our studies, such as Flebiopsis uh, crassa, Arthrinium malishanum, Fialiminiopsis cornearis, Felinus bicuspidatus, Regidopurus hypogruneus. Although Regidopurus species, um, we've seen them before as seagrass fungal endophytes, but not as mango uh, uh, fungal endophytes. Okay, so again, if you'll notice again and again, once we change the environment, once we change the mangrove host, we usually find a new bat, a new new species of fungi. And these are again good sources of bioactive uh, components. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we have not yet been able to examine the bioactive components of this particular fungi. These are supposed to be tested sana again for cytotoxicity, but we have not yet been able to do that. <clears throat> so, but the, our students have been able to make a catalog of mangrove fungal endophytes so, so that it will be easier for future generations, uh, we usually place there the colonies, how they look like, and the proof, the molecular proof that indeed that is the ID for that particular uh, isolate. So this is, an, uh, this, are, this is an excerpt of the catalog of Magogun uh, endophytic fungi that um, where uh, that was done by my students. Um, in the past, we've also been able to publish uh, together with our collaborators in the Ken uh, Department of USP um, active components from mangrove fungal endophyte, uh, Phyllospicta species. Um, we were able to to describe tyrosol C, which is an antioxidant and anti-cancer, and cytosporin B, which is antibacterial. We were also able to describe a new species of fungus, which we collected from Exo Exoecaria agaloca in Batangas, Philippines. This is also a fungal endophyte and it was discovered to be a fungal, uh, an, uh, a novel fungal endophyte, a novel species. And when we were naming the, when we were naming this, it just so happened that it coincided with the visit of Pope Francis in UST. So we named this after Pope Francis. So this is named Phyllosticta francisi in order of Pope Francis. So this was one of the tributes of the College of Science for um, Pope Francis and his visit to USP. Also, we are, were able to produce, uh, to write a book chapter where we placed here the findings that we have on fungal endophytes and their bioactivities. This is a book published by Elsevier, Elsevier um, Biodiversity and Biomedicine. 
our book chapters entitled Biomining Fungal Endophytes from Tropical Plants and Seaweeds for Drug Discovery. So if you are interested, you can actually uh, read that chapter. Um, it includes the bubble of fungal endophytes. This includes also um, um, land plants and some seaweed fungal endophytes. Okay? And their bioactive uh, and their bioactivities. So I think that with this discussion, we saw the diversity of the mangrove fungal endophytes and, their, and the possibility of using them as sources of various active components. So as I have said, we are just uh, on the surface of, the, of, of studying this mangrove fungal endophytes. And we hope that we can collaborate this with other people as there are still many mangroves to be studied around the Philippines. We are just working actually in Leyte. Marami pa yan sa Luzon, sa parts of Visayas, and parts of Mindanao. So, and also we, we, we are able to get bioactive compounds from this, from this mangrove. So it's another, it's another reason for studying them. So with that, I say let's collaborate and have fun with fungi. So you'll see there, my, you'll see here my um, email address if you want to contact me to ask questions or possibly to collaborate on working with uh, fungal endophytes. And I think that will be the end of my talk. I hope that there are questions so that we can possibly discuss the topic some more. Thank you very much again and good morning. Thank you very much, Sir Chris. Indeed, it was a fun, <laughs> fun <laughs> presentation. No? Uh, it, very you know, enlightening, especially for me, no? because uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not. Uh, man of science pagdating dito sa sa museum i'm more of a communicator uh we are um accepting questions from the audience right now if you want to put your if you want your questions to be read by me so you just put it in the chat box or if you want to ask your question live uh let me please uh let us know okay uh we have we have a one long question here from Jonathan Jaime Guerrero. Um, good day. Uh, he's from Bicol University and he is working on mangrove endophytes here in Bicol. So I think you're not alone, sir. Uh, sir, have you, have you or are you also interested in to looking at comparing the endophytes of the, nat endophytes of the natural growth and the introduced or planted mangroves. I think he's, uh, uh, there are, you know, the yes. naturally growing uh, mangroves versus the endophytes that, uh, that you can see from the ones that you know, reforested mangroves. Uh, many of the mangrove forests in the countries are products of mangrove planting activities, I think, especially the rhizospora species. So maybe, you know, are you, going to have a comparison later on of the that natural growth versus planted rhizospora species it could be a researchable area so yeah what are your thoughts on that all right thank you very much you know, for the question that, that is actually a very that is a, a very interesting idea and in fact i already have a group of students working on on that but it took us a while to get into this into this um, idea of comparing um, the, the, the usual mangrove forests and the reforested mangroves because um, we were still, our focus then was so much on mangrove forests and the naturally occurring mangroves. But we also know that there would be a difference in the fungal endophytes between those that have been naturally grown and those that have been reforested. Um, fortunately for us, no, after Yolanda, there had been mangrove reforestation in several areas here in Tacloban City. So that is now the focus of one of my groups, mangrove fungal endophytes. 
but the mangroves are from a reforested um from a rehabilitated or reforested uh mangrove area that is actually a very interesting um interesting idea when it comes to mangrove fungal endocrines yeah okay. especially if uh, sir jaime I don't know um, what the, what is the status of the mangrove stands in Bicol, but probably if you could collaborate later on, no? uh, maybe Sir Jaime could uh, uh, collect the mang uh, mangrove uh, and fungi for you or collaborate with your laboratory. So, merong at least diba, from Bicol, merong naturally grown uh, mangroves na sources of these uh, endophytic uh, fungi. Yes, true. Um, it's actually good if we can collaborate because we're, we're actually working almost on the same field so that we can also try to compare the species of mangroves that we have if we have already encountered them. And let's try to compare again if we have, because based on our studies here, we rarely have, uh, we rarely have identical uh, 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 or common isolates even on, on the same species of mangroves. Mm -hmm. So I want to see if we can, if if we can see that, for example, in Bicol, for example, Sonerasha alba and the Sonerasha alba that we have here, will we possibly see the same species of, of mangrove fungal endophytes? That is something that I want, that I am interested about. So yeah. it's it's actually good if, we're, if we'll also be able to collaborate on these things. Okay, uh, follow up lang ni Jonathan Jaime Guerrero. Um, he will be happy to collaborate. Uh, he says that many of his uh, endophytes are already deposited here in the Museum of Natural History. I think, uh, I think Ma'am Marian would be able to uh, uh, contribute here. Okay, um, I think this is a you know a, a very simple question from me. Uh, can you give you know? Uh, a short explanation uh, why do you think these uh, fungal endophytes are prevalent in mangrove species are they more prevalent in mangrove species uh, compared to other plants what is you know, what do you think is causing uh, mangroves to to produce or to harbor these organisms compared to other plants uh, actually, uh, the fungal endophytes are not just actually prevalent in mangroves. They're also prevalent in, in many land plants. Mm -hmm. Actually, there are also many studies of fungal endophytes on land plants. However, um, it just so happened that um, it seems that more, more fungal, there are more fungal endophytes with good bioactivity mm -hmm. coming from mangroves. It may be this I, I am not sure about this now as they, as we have not also seen a good explanation for this. It may be because of the unique environment that the mangroves are in, being on a like a combination of a land plant, but it's on also on a parang uh, salty environment yeah, or brackish things or... like the uh, brackish environment. So it may be it may have something to do with that, but there are also other studies, naman on land plants, na fungal endophytes, and there are also um, bioactive components, din naman already in this in these land plants. So follow up lang. Um, so you've said that these um, fungal endophytes they do not directly cause uh, the diseases, right? Mm -hmm. um, but are they, you know, do they factor in in, in other, you know, uh, you know, other causes of uh, of death of the mangrove? Like, are they, do they have a role in decomposition? You know, nutrient recycling, especially of mangroves. Uh, do they have other ecological, you know, roles? In, during the course of the lifetime of the mangrove, that's why I said earlier that the 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 relationship between the fungal endophyte and the mangrove should be that of balanced antagonism. So that but palagishan balance. Because for example, if there comes a point when the fungus, for example, when the plant becomes weaker than the fungus, then there is a chance that this fungal endophyte will actually turn pathogenic for that particular plant. So um, it may not be that the 
fungal endophyte will always remain a fungal endophyte inside the plant. It depends also on the on the different um, on the different conditions in the plant and in the environment. But as but as much as possible, if that balanced antagonism is maintained, then that will remain as a fungal endophyte until the plant dies. Now, after the plant dies, um, it can have again the usual ecological use of fungi, which is usually for um, recycling down the, the, the plant. However, in the course also of the lifetime of the plant, it is also believed that fungal endophytes actually also protect the plant, much like our normal flora oh, in, in humans. In so it also has a protective uh, action uh, on the plant. So there and in the Shout out para pala siyang Yakult, no? Yes, para yes. ganun. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, from Jennifer Niem, um, uh, her question is, um, uh, she doesn't know if she, if you have presented this, but uh, although she might have missed it, but have you done a dual culture assay of your fungal endophytes against known pathogens of mangrove as a preliminary as a preliminary test of their biocontrol activity against these natural pathogens? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. This is actually being done by some of our, some of my lab mates noon, some of my group mates noon in the, in, in UST. Unfortunately, my interest does not lie, sorry, personal interest ito, does not lie on, on control of plant pathogens, but rather my interest lies on control of medically related pathogens. That's why most of my studies are actually geared towards antibacterial, cytotoxic. But yes, there are many studies that are conducted to, to test also the effect of fungal endophytes on other plant pathogens. And yes, okay. it's done through a dual culture. Unfortunately, I don't have results for that. <laughs> yes. But uh, do you think, um, what do you think are the advantages of using endophytes as a biocontrol agent? as compared with other organisms that can be isolated on other hosts. Um, I think she's talking about, you know, the potential of um, these endophytes as biocontrol, uh, like the, for other purposes, not for, you know, human, human medicine and, and other applications such as that. Well, um, the, the advantage of using fungi as sources of bioactive components, no? is that fungi are actually easy to mass produce. Madali silang padamihin. As in, you can have a big bat and you place a fungus there and they'll actually multiply. And with that, you have a very big source of bioactive components. Madali mo siyang paglaruan, madali mo siyang ma-extract. So that is the advantage of having fungi as a source of bioactive components. So from Roque Porcel, uh, he's from from PUP, Polytechnic University of the Philippines. And he would like to ask if you have tried to test the secondary metabolites of these MEFs or mangrove fungal endophytes on their potential angiogenetic or angiogenic activity. So it's for angiogenesis. That's the first question. And uh, the second one is there a time that you were not able to isolate fungal endophytes from mangroves? So thanks and have a good day, Paul. Unfortunately, I don't have any angiogenic studies on on, on my extracts mm -hmm. as they're limited usually to antibacterial, cytotoxic, and antioxidants sometimes. I said uh, testing, actually in vitro testing can be quite tedious already. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you'll notice, no, you usually test so many fungi, uh, fungal endophytes, and then a uh, candidate mo lang nalalabas is isa or dalawa. So um, that's why we tend also to limit the types of tests that we do. And it also, um, it's also a good use of the, of the resources. So unfortunately, we don't have data on angiogenic uh, activity. But there are studies. 
have there yes. been studies? Uh, I I know that there are also studies on that. I am just not familiar with the with the the results, but mm -hmm. I'm sure there are studies on that. Okay. The other one is yes. Um, there there is only one instance where we are not able to to isolate a mangrove fungal endophyte from a host, which is which is actually quite surprising for us. But in any rate, we were only also able to isolate one mangrove fungal endophyte on on the same species on another another area. So, it, but for for us, it only happened once. Most of the time, man, we're able to isolate the mangrove fungal endophyte. So another question, uh, do fungal endophytes and filamentous fungi of the same species, do they uh, exhibit the same bioactivity? Do, I do of, uh, of the same species? Yeah, filamentous uh, does okay. uh, fungal endophytes and filamentous fungi of the same species, or probably I think uh, it could be a... Uh, so, exhibit the same uh, bioactivity we we believe that as long as they are the same species now that they should exhibit the same um bioactivity but it yeah. has to it for me it remains to be tested because it might be that the species that uh, that is a fungal endophyte is a different has an entirely different mode of uh, uh, or has somewhat um, evolved something different from the one that is not a fungal endophyte. It mm -hmm. is something that um, we have not done yet uh, to compare the bioactivities of the same species um, of fungi, one that is not a fungal endophyte and the other is a fungal endophyte. But as fungal endophytes, if you'll notice in my presentation, like Pestelichopsis adusta is a known um, fungal endophyte with antibacterial activity. You see also that when we tested it, indeed, it has an antibacterial activity, which actually um, uh, confirms the one that is found in literature. Okay. Question from Dr. Marian De Leon. Uh, hi, Chris. Thank you for thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Um, may I know how do you preserve your fungi, especially those with the known activity? Actually, Ma'am Marian, no. Um, this is why what we find very challenging. Actually, even uh, in uh, even when we were in Beijing, I also asked them how how what is the best way to to preserve them. Um, kami kasi especially though kami. to die because most of them do not produce spores um the the long-term culture uh, uh, preservation should still should this uh, be in glycerol sana and then um you you place you supposedly place the agar blocks inside like a microtube and then freeze them but sometimes it's not effective because they are not producing if especially if they do not have spores. So what we do is to constantly keep them alive in culture, in place. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Dr. De Leon. <laughs> okay. So from Melanie Carnahe of uh, PUP, uh, they are also interested, highly interested in MFE or my, uh, mangrove fungal endophytes. And... Um, they are currently starting a thesis regarding antibiotic activities of MFE. So uh, she's curious on how or what procedures did you conduct to assure that the obtained fungi from mangroves are endophytic? Or how can you be assured from time to time if the mangroves and the endophytes relationship is balanced? Um, I will... Uh, answer the last question first. So there is no way for us to check whether the mangrove and endophyte in mangrove and the fungal endophyte um, relationship is balanced. Because it's, it's more of a plant fishy thing. Mm -hmm. But 
we don't really need to check that when we just want to isolate the mangrove fungal endophytes. So what is more important is that of the first question, how do we make sure that the isolates that we're getting are fungal endophytes? So um, if you're working on fungal endophytes, I'm sure that you are familiar that uh, before we plate the leaves um, or any part where you wish to isolate the fungal endophyte, we have to surface sterilize them we have to surface sterilize them, meaning we need to kill all of the microorganisms outside. So you must have a plate that is a control plate where you are going to touch the leaves that you sterilize so that you will be able to check if your sterilization is okay. When you check the control plate and you see lots of fungi growing there, then that means you're your sterilization is not okay, and all of the fungi that may be growing on your plates may not be fungal endophytes. So you have to repeat that. So that is the way to make sure. Now, if your control plate does not have any growth, that means your surface sterilization was effective. So all of the fungi that will grow out of the leaves, since your surface sterilization is effective, are now fungal endophytes. You are assured that they are endophytic fungi. So that is the way for us to, to be sure that what we are culturing are not environmental or, ed, or epiphytic fungi. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Follow-up question. Um, have you thought of, you know, in your research, have you thought of including the entire microbiome of the mangrove, which includes the epiphytes as well? Not really, because um, we're not interested in the epiphytes, because as I have said, uh, um, our, our second goal is always to be able to, to um, work on bioactivities. So while well, there are also people who are working on the entire microbiome, including the epiphytes, with the uh, including the different parts of the of the mangroves, but for us we usually only focus on the uh, foliage, the leaves, and then so that we can still move on towards the second part because you know diversity study alone is actually a big thing to handle. Mm -hmm. Uh, morphologic classification and molecular classification will take time. It takes about six to eight months to do it. So, every study, meron kang time to do the second phase of the of the study, which is the uh, study of the bioactivities. Thank you. Uh, my question. Um, you said earlier that the metabolites, there, there are some metabolites or compounds that are uh, produced by the plant, but are actually produced by the fungus, right? So have you encountered a fungal endophyte which produces the compound synergistically with the plant? Mm -hmm. So it's so, parang, there's some sort of, you know, the plant produces this compound and the fungus produces this one and it combines and produces uh, something else. Um. Personally, no, I I have no experience with that as I do not usually work with the plants, but there are published studies that have actually proven that there is a substance that is produced both by the plant and the fungus. So you can no longer say whether, whether the one that you isolated from the plant is really just from the plant itself exactly. or the plant was actually facilitated by the fungus. I see. So, okay. okay. so um, have you already received any pure or isolated compound from your international collaborators, uh, which you have already tested? So, so you, you've said earlier that the, you, you, the, you need your fungi to be isolated and purified for mm -hmm. to conduct uh, further tests have no, you um, gotten 
isolation and purification of the fungi, that's something that we do. No, mm -hmm. kaya lang yung extract na like kaya yung candidate namin. Yeah, the, the chemist. Uh, so, uh -huh. il, ipapasa na namin yung sa aming mga chemist friends. Mm -hmm. So, um, so far, yun palang ang binu-work out namin ngayon. Yung, yung in the past, pinakina, pinakita ko na sa inyo kanina, they were already published before yung uh, Cytosporum B and the uh, yung isa pa na, na active component that, that were already um that were already described. So basically, yun ang kanyang supposed path na pag merong bioactivity, dapat makita nila kung anong chemical talaga yun, mm. active component, and we're able to describe it. But it takes years yeah. to do it. <laughs> and so, so far, uh, sa mga so far, wala pang bago ulit. Yes, okay. So, <clears throat> what is the timeline? Would we, would we see it in how many uh, years? Ten years, uh, perhaps? Hindi naman niya taganon ka tagal yun. Um, unfortunately, we've been stuck because of the pandemic. Lumabas yung aming cytotoxic activity na yun. Last year pa, mga 2020. Then supposedly, dapat ma-workout na sana yun. Wala, nandun nga yun sa freezer ng lab. <laughs> Sayang naman. Anyway, wala tayong magagawa ito, eh. di ba? Right? So, yeah. Uh, any more questions from the audience before we uh, wrap it all up? Siguro ako, last na lang, I was fairly interested in that, uh, you know, yung Enix, you were talking about there's a difference when uh, it between the ones that are stationary and the ones in that have been agitated, uh -huh. continuously agitated. So, what is your hypothesis on that? So, the hypothesis kasi nun, uh, that was actually a hypothesis that, uh, that we actually made while discussing something dun sa lang sa, sa Beijing. So, sabi nila, there must be a difference, there may be a difference in the production of the bioactive components if you have a different condition of the, of the fungi. So since equipment was available naman na pwede siya i, they have equipment na i-agitate siya for a month. Mm -hmm. So that is what we did. And in fact, we saw something different. There are fungi who like to be agitated. There are fungi who don't like to be agitated. agitated. So ngayon, iniisip po na naman namin na that's two, two conditions na naman na susundan in, in a test. And that multiplies the test to two instead of just uh, <laughs> doing it in one. So, um, so far, we're just equipping ourselves for, for an, a constant agitator of our fungi. So, so far, for now, puro naka-stationary ang, uh, ang aming growth dito sa lab. But the one that's a good candidate for cytotoxicity, yung my 7 uh, IC50, that was just grown in um, stationary condition. So, as per Ma'am De Leon, agitation allows contact with the nutrients consumed by the fungi. Mm -hmm. I think. Yes. And yes. I, I don't know. Air? Pati ba air? Kasama doon? Pero, pero merong iba kasi na hindi kasi siya ganun ka, hindi kasi siya um, uniform. Mm -hmm. There are some which perform better when they're agitated. There are some that do not perform well when they are agitated. So yun ang find, uh, ang lumabas dun sa, sa ano na yun. So maybe, may mga fungi na ayaw sila. Yeah. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully if you pursue that line, you know, you'll be able to check whether, yeah. um, you know, baka meron ding alternate, you know, may alternate oh. agitation ka, like, uh, uh, or there must be an optimum speed of agitation. Pwede rin. Hindi I rin natin alam. So, maraming factors pa yun. Yes, I think yes. There are still many things that can actually be examined. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, I think that's all for now. Uh, we have no more questions. Uh, although Dr. Jen uh, also commented that uh, agitation also provides aeration, giving steady mm -hmm. supply of oxygen. So, uh, maraming salamat, Sir Chris, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. And to all our attendees, uh, thank you for uh, participating, uh, throwing in your questions, and hearing uh, the discussion of Sir Carlo Chris Apurillo. So, before we finalize or wrap, our, wrap up our 
webinar i've i think i've already uh let me let me just put again the link to the evaluation form it's already in the chat box so please click on it and uh, try to evaluate our webinar as soon as possible and while you are doing that let me just uh uh proceed with the you know the traditional giving of certificate of recognition although we are doing this uh, now uh, virtually so on behalf of our director we are giving this certificate of recognition uh, awarded to carlo chris s apurillo for serving as our resource person during this uh, biodiversity seminar entitled Exploring Mangrove Fungal Endophyte Diversity and Natural Products held today, March 2, 2021 from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. In witness whereof, the signature of our director is here unto a fix given today at UPLB College Laguna, signed uh, Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez, our director. So, um... I've already put the link to the evaluation form, but if you're familiar with uh, Bitly, you could uh, go to bit.ly slash 2021-bss-eval later. Uh, we will accept responses only until 5 p.m. Uh, if you are, if we invite you to uh, visit our website, mnh.uplb.edu.ph, and if you want to drop an email, just write us at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph we are you can check out our accounts facebook twitter youtube and instagram just search for the handle uplb museum and uh, we are also we have articles in wikipedia and trip advisor so maraming salamat sir chris for that Thank wonderful much, presentation sir. and uh, we hope that you will be able to uh, serve as one of our uh, speakers in the near future. Thank you very much, sir. And all the participants this morning, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Don't forget to click on that link and evaluate our webinar.